right, George? Good evening. Uh, welcome to the Coastal Studies Institute. Thanks everyone for joining us here at the ECU OBX campus and uh, thanks for those that are joining online for our Science on the Sound series. Um, it's great that we've been able to get these series started again. Um, this is a great way for us here at CSI to connect with our community. And we've got a nice one, a great one lined up tonight. Um, I am uh, George Bonner. I'm the director of the North Carolina Renewable Energy Program and uh, I was fortunate to move back home here to Manio after a 30-year career away from Manio and uh, be part and join the CSI team. And it really is an amazing team of folks that are really passionate about uh, our coast. And uh, I've also been fortunate to work with two amazing um, scientists, uh, Dr. Lindsey Dubbs and Dr. Mike Mulia, who've been part of this program, our ocean energy program, from the beginning. And uh, tonight we're going to hear about Mike. And uh, Mike is passionate about surfing. He's passionate about uh, protecting our ocean energy resource, our ocean resources. He's passionate about bringing science and innovation on how we can harvest our ocean energy resources in a responsible way. And he's also passionate about building that next generation of innovators and ocean stewards. And did I mention he's passionate about surfing? <laughs> uh, but uh, Mike has multiple degrees in uh, physics and oceanography, starting out at the University of Miami and uh, UNC Wilmington and got his PhD from UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, so let's welcome Mike and we're looking forward to hearing from him. Well, thank you all for coming out. I see so many faces that I know. I, I appreciate you coming out, it's exciting. Um, so tonight I'd like to talk about renewable ocean energy developments from concepts to kites or from theory to throwing it overboard. Um, it's been quite an adventure since we started with the Renewable Ocean Energy Program here at CSI. And what's been exciting to me is to see things go from just ideas and concepts on paper to where we are now, where we're actually getting ready to deploy something that's going to provide energy in a real life situation. So you'll see some of those developments. Um, what, do, what do you all think I mean by ocean energy? Anybody want to take a stab at that? And I think Parker's got a mic here, so. Oh, she's not ready for that. I'm, so what, is it offshore wind, or at, what do you guys think? Anybody want to take, take a stab? Ocean current. Oh, ocean current, <laughs> wave energy. Oh, cool, all right, you guys already know all about this. I like it. All right, so it could be ocean currents, like big open ocean currents, like the Gulf Stream. We're lucky to have the biggest western boundary current here or it could be waves, or it could be currents through inlets, like tidally driven currents, but it's kind of everything aside from wind and solar. So it's, it's a pretty new industry, which is why it's not necessarily cost competitive with wind and solar that have been around for 50 or 100 years, something like that. But um, first I'm gonna tell you a little, a little bit about my lab and what my lab does to contribute to this effort. Um, then a little bit, I like to start with acknowledgments because I think they're important and they're, it's not me doing this, it's not my lab doing this, it's a huge team of us across multidisciplinary um, efforts. And so it's important to acknowledge that and I like to begin with that because I don't think it's an afterthought. Um, and then we'll get into the fun stuff if you all humor me for a little bit. Device deployments, which will pretty much be a picture and movie show of all the things we've been doing recently. So you'll get to see what these things look like and what they do in the water. And then hopefully we'll have lots of questions and discussion that follow. So um, I'm a scientist at heart, not an engineer. So I have to start by talking about the oceanography off of North Carolina, because that's what really gets me excited. Um, <clears throat> we happen to live in one of the best places in the world for oceanography, the coolest, most exciting places ever. And what do I mean by that? Um, well, we have this huge confluence of all these different water masses and currents right off of Cape Hatteras, so in our backyard, essentially, right? And what we have is this big recirculation to the north. We have, of course, everybody knows the Gulf Stream flowing up from the south what we say is the upper limb of meridional overturning circulation. And then if you focus in a little bit more on what's going on on the shelf, south of Cape Hatteras, we have this salty warm water. On average, it's flowing from south to north, and we call that the South Atlantic Bight Shelf Water. And from the north, we have the Mid-Atlantic Bight Shelf Water. We call this the cold pool. This water is relatively fresh, and it's cooler, obviously. 
and they meet at the Hatteras front. And this is a lot like a front that you see on your weather maps, except it's in the ocean. And a lot of us that live here know this intuitively because this front gets pushed north and south with the wind, and the Gulf Stream's wiggling around out here, and that affects it as well. And so, as a surfer, we know in the wintertime that when we get a big blow out of the south, it pushes this front up north, and we can go down here to the lighthouse and surf, and we can wear less rubber and take our gloves off that day. And then all of a sudden, a cold front comes through, and it pushes this water all the way down here, and then even in Frisco, it's cold again. So um, we kind of get to know that as fishers or, or surfers or anybody that's out on the water. Um, and then, of course, we have the greatest western boundary current on Earth, the Gulf Stream. It moves w more water than any western boundary current, and so I do a lot of research with the Gulf Stream. And how do we understand what's going on with all these complicated things? Well, my team makes lots of ocean observations. And so this map shows many different types of observations that we've been making over the past 20 years. And some of these are sustained, like right now, I'm measuring things, which is nice, because when I sit down to drink beer, I know I'm still working, right? <laughs> still collecting data, right? Um, <clears throat> so what, what are all these things? So I'd like to point out we have Jeanette's Pier up here, near and dear to my heart, because Mike Rimmage is a good friend of mine, the director. And we have a terrific working relationship with Mike and his team. They support lots of research there. We do lots of work over at Jeanette's, and Mike is terrific to work with. Um, and you'll see plenty more Jeanette's in the rest of this talk. Um, we also support these wave rider buoys offshore. There's one about 10 miles off of Jeanette's, one off of Pea Island, and one off of Buxton. And they measure um, wave height, period, direction. And this one down here is really cool because it measures surface current as well. And all these data are available online for free, so you can check them out. This one's known as the Oregon Inlet buoy. That's been there a long time. We use a network of radars along the land here, and they measure ocean surface currents. I'll show you a picture of that in a moment. And they measure them every hour. So they're a powerful tool for looking at the Gulf Stream and how it varies hourly. And the only observation I know where you can do that remotely. Um, and then we have lots of moorings, and they're different frequency acoustic Doppler current profilers. So these are like fancy fish finders that sit on the bottom, and they measure what the current's doing over the entire water column. And they can stay out there for a couple of years, so we get a nice long-term measurement at one spot of what the current's doing. We make repeated, whoops, I hit the wrong thing. We make repeated crossings of the Gulf Stream to look what's happening with vessels, and I'll talk a little more about that in a moment. And meteorologically, we need to know what's going on with the wind, with the heat flux. So we're putting heat into the ocean and changing the temperature and the density of the water. And that has a lot to do with the physics as well. And then we also have these really cool things I'm not going to focus on tonight called gliders. And they look like a torpedo with wings. And what they do is they change buoyancy. And when they start to sink, the wings give them forward thrust. And when they start to float, does the same. So we're basically flying a sawtooth with instruments on it for months. And this is a way of getting inexpensive, inexpensive measurements in the ocean because ship time's really, really expensive. So this is a new toy like in the last 10 years that lots of oceanographers are using. So all this is going on in your backyard. And all the information we get from this stuff, oh, one more thing. So I want to introduce a coming talk. I think January or February, we hope to have someone from Woods Hole come down to talk about this. A lot of folks in the Outer Banks haven't heard about this. but um, the National Science Foundation is going to put a cross-shelf array of moorings and fly lots of these gliders and unmanned underwater vehicles for 10 years here. So that is coming in spring 2024, and you'll hear a lot more about that very soon. Um, these are just examples of some of the measurements that, that our team has made. So this is what the HF radar sees in terms of surface currents. These hotter colors are the faster moving currents. And you can kind of pick out the Gulf Stream and what we call a meander, like wave in the Gulf Stream. To get a picture of this every hour is very valuable for us, whether we're trying to understand the Gulf Stream and how it influences what's going on in the shelf, or if we're trying to understand how much energy we have from the Gulf Stream and how we can get at it. Um, this is a cross Gulf Stream transect that we made with our boat. Essentially, we start right here on the shelf, and we drive across the Gulf Stream. This is the bottom. And the hot colors here, we've broken it into offshore and longshore. So U and B, you can think about this like east and north. 
and this is the speed, and you can kind of see the Gulf Stream is about 1,000 meters deep off of Cape Hatteras. And the reason we break it up into components is so that this flow right here pops a little bit. This is the deep western boundary current that comes down along the bottom here, and it actually intersects the Gulf Stream or passes beneath it just off of Cape Hatteras. So another reason we're in the coolest place in the world. Um, <clears throat> these are an example of some of the buoy measurements. This is the wave height over time, the peak period, which means the most energetic wave that we're measuring and the period of that wave, the peak direction, and the average period over time. And then this is an example of a long time series of, ah, I can't get used to this pointer, of currents that we've made with one of those moored acoustic Doppler current profilers. So this is one place in a long time, and the hot colors are the faster currents. And so this is depth, so the surface is here, we're going down, and then this is through time. And what we did is we put this instrument, ah, right here. And so you see like the, the cool colors here? I can't do this. I'm so used to having a regular pointer. Okay, the cool colors are slow currents, and what's happening when you see the hot colors, that's the Gulf Stream meandering over the instrument, going back off and going back over. And this is our baby, the Miss Caroline. We're very proud of this boat because um, actually John Bayless took the time to sit down with us many years ago. We asked John, you know, we told him this is what we want to do. We want to drive across the Gulf Stream, we want to deploy things, we want to do this with regularity, what do we do? And he said, if you can get a Duffy, then that's the right boat. So we went up from the Northeast and we bought this boat and we drove it down through New York and brought it home. And then we had a good friend of ours, Stormy Harrington, outfit it with all kinds of cool instruments. He put the A-frame on, the back deck station. We have two, you can't see them too well here, but two through hull like wells with instruments that measure the current beneath the boat. And we make measurements with this boat like this. So this is the Coastal Studies Institute on a winter day. We're driving out from the backyard across the shelf, right off, here's Cape Hatteras, and we drive across the Gulf Stream with that boat. And so this curve is the water temperature. So essentially we're going from about 20 and a half degrees Celsius to about 25 degrees. And this is really cool, like in the length of about a soccer field, we're going from this cold water, we're bundled up to the Gulf Stream. And then we're taking off our clothes and it's like a summer day. So it's like miraculous to go out there. It's, you just went to a different climate. And everything's different. And the, the Gulf Stream is like driving the atmosphere, causing clouds and stuff to build up there. And the wave field is different. So a lot of times it's bumpy here and flat here, depending on the wind, or flat here and hell on earth out here. So it's, it's pretty wild. Now the, the ribbon underneath or what we use the acoustic Doppler current profilers that, that are on the boat for. So what we're doing is we're measuring the current beneath the boat down to about 500 meters, and the current speed goes from about zero to about two and a half meters per second, which is almost five knots. So it's screaming. So when you, you don't want to break down out there because you know, you'll be in Ireland pretty quickly. <laughs> <coughs> All right, so acknowledgments. There's a huge team of people that have been working on the stuff that I'm going to show you. Oops. And, and it, takes, it really takes a village. You have great leaders like George and Reed, our director, some, the director of the Department of Energy's Water Power Technologies office, and program managers, my boss, Stu. All these people you come to with these crazy ideas, and they support you and facilitate them. And it's important, and they're not so crazy anymore. <laughs> our, our administrative support, I mean, I hate to use an, an F word here, but I hate forms. So I'm <laughs> dropping the F bomb. And without them, I could not handle that. Um, at CSI, Dr. Lindsay Dubbs does a lot of the biological work. She's a co-leader with me of the, re of the Renewable Ocean Energy Program. She's outstanding. Her whole lab is. Corey Adams does tons of stuff. Our own John McCord in the back. Say hi, John. <laughs> he, um, whoops. Look at this acknowledgement. Everything I'm going to show you, very thankfully, most of it's photographed or the videography is done by George because you don't want to see what happens when I take pictures, right? Or George, John, sorry. John. Yeah, you don't want to see what I, when I take pictures. Uh, John will ask me to take pictures when I'm out in the field and I'll bring back my pictures. He's like, oh, I can't use this. <laughs> um, 
Mike Ramage and his team at Jeanette's Pier have done so much work for us. Um, there's tons of folks at NC State that have worked on a lot of the engineering that I'm going to show you. Um, Wes Williams from UNC Charlotte is another great engineer that we continue to work with. And there's a whole team at the National Renewable Energy Labs that have contributed to this. So it's not me. I'm just, all I do is tell them what the ocean, I think the ocean's going to do, and they do the rest. And this is my team. So very diverse team, young to old. I'm the ancient one. Um, Beginning with Miley McManus, she started working with us in eighth grade. She's brilliant. She's still working with us. Um, we have lots of undergraduate students that have come and gone over the years from lots of different institutions. Vega and Jude have been here before. We just saw Vega in Spain, and he was happy when we were there. And um, <clears throat> Sawyer was our research experience for undergrad scholar that was here this summer. Cora has been an intern for two years. She's like the family. Um, Jacqueline is here tonight. She's my PhD student. Tripp and Spencer are my heroes. Those are like my right and left hand. And um, gosh, I'm, I'm certainly forgetting someone. I have a postdoc, Zaid, who's working with us. He's coming back from Iraq like tomorrow. Um, and so you can see like across the board, we built a team that we're really proud of and they're fun to work with. And we wouldn't have accomplished so much without them. And then there's lots of sponsors, right? Sponsors and collaborators. So you can see all the logos here. These are all institutions that have contributed to this work. And one of the most exciting ones is the Atlantic Marine Energy Center. So yes. Oh, you're whoop whoop. All right, so <laughs> this, is a, this is a huge accomplishment for us. We are one of four institutional founding members of the Atlantic Marine Energy Center, CSI is. And what that means is um, it's building a foundation for continuing the work that you see for people to work through us, be it businesses, academics, or somebody in their backyard who has a great idea. So this is really exciting that CSI uh, actually got this award, and, and it'll continue for some time. All right, so ocean energy takes a village, and it takes a multidisciplinary village. And so what does that mean? Social science and stakeholder engagement are so important. So I'm a physical scientist. I'm a physics guy. I work with engineers. And we all think the same, which means, all right, let's see how much we have out there. What, where's the best wave resource? Where should we go put this thing? And then how can we build something to get that energy? And we think that's all there is, right? That's what you do to get ocean energy. And that's totally wrong. So without social science and stakeholder engagement, me going out, not me, but these teams going out and talking to the fishing community. Hey, if we put some buoys out there, is that going to be all right? How are you going to perceive that? How's that going to work? How can we help you? How can you help us? That's very important, because otherwise, it's back to legal mess and the F-bomb forms. So we don't <laughs> want that. Um, biological and environmental evaluation. So we're trying to do more good than harm. Everything we do has a cost, right? Even clean energy is not cost-free. So how can we limit you know, the damage that we might do? And what kind of critters might, 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 we, uh, bleh, might, we, might we affect if we go put a wave energy converter out there or underwater turbine? Um, education and outreach. This is a really new endeavor. So there aren't people to start building wave energy converters, right? So we need to bring those people up to speed on what we're actually doing and teach them, and then they'll surpass us. Connectivity. So the Federally, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission is no joke. If you want to put something offshore and connect it to the grid, it's a lot, right? A lot of the F-bombs. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and standards are important, right? We have underwriters' laboratories. You know about that because you have a light bulb that has been tested. It's not going to burn down your house. We need the same thing for wave energy converters, for turbines. What kind of materials can we use? What works? What doesn't? You can follow the standards on that. So all this stuff is important, and there's one four-letter word. It's, I don't see too many kids in the audience. So this one's the worst one. Just bad, right? Starts with a C, ends with a T. Very dirty word. I tried never to use it in my lab, even though I'm a pirate. Can't. <laughs> mm. Can. We can figure it out, right? All right. This is the good stuff. This is what you came for. You want to see what's going on, right? Device deployments. So... We just had a huge event at Jeanette's Pier called Waves to Water. And 
This was a five-stage, $3.3 million in awards to these competitors that had to fit their wave energy converters in this box. And it had to weigh, I think, less than 2,000, less than 1,000 pounds. And you'll see a video about the competition here, but a couple things that aren't that obvious from the video are this box, right? And these are the anchors that were provided for the devices. So these are bundled piles of chain that we put in the water at Jeanette. And usually they get sedimented in. And, um, and then we pull them out when we're done. So they weigh about 2,000 pounds. And we deploy them with the Miss Caroline. So let's see if this is going to work. It's always scary putting me. harness the unpredictable power of waves to produce drinking water for people that need it most. The American-made Waves to Water Prize aims to accelerate the development of small, modular wave-powered desalination systems capable of providing potable drinking water locally to communities in disaster relief situations and those in remote coastal locations. Particularly in a disaster response scenario, wave power has, a, has an interesting ability <laughs> to complement other technologies, but it has a different time scale and it has a different energy density to it. Wave energy technologies aren't intended to replace other desalination technologies, but complement the ones that we already have. So right now we're just entering into the drink phase of the prize, which is the final contest. It's a five-day test where we're actually going to be testing and demonstrating these technologies in an open ocean environment. The Waves to Water Prize has partnered with the Coastal Studies Institute to host the final drink stage of the competition at Jeanette's Pier in North Carolina's Outer Banks. In anticipation of the final competition, NREL researchers have been designing and building a modular hydraulic and electric reverse osmosis wave energy converter known as the Hero Wave. Our goal is to ultimately reduce deployment risks and measurement uncertainty at the drink stage by giving the CSI team a representative system that will be used as a test case prior to the competitors arriving at Jeanette's Pier. This will ensure the event goes smoothly and we can focus on the innovations for each of the competitors. We're really excited to partner with NREL and Department of Energy and Jeanette's Pier on this game-changing, transformative way of coupling wave energy technologies with desalination technologies to deliver safe drinking water to our coastal communities. This Waves to Water Challenge is a really innovative way of advancing research and innovation in this area. Now, what we're really hoping for applicants to provide are technologies that have an interesting or a different approach to the wave power technology solution as well as the desalination solution. These are two inherently challenging problems that are both interdisciplinary by nature, and so combining them could create some very interesting solutions. So the obvious way people can get involved is through competitors developing technologies, uh, but there are also other opportunities, whether it be incubators, sponsors, or other supporters, such as uh, testing facilities that can be involved. What I'm really trying to get out of this prize is technologies that really demonstrate that wave energy is interesting. And they can be useful and it has a place in this world, particularly in the case of water, right? So there's areas around where we don't have access to clean water and the ability to really use this, this other form of renewable energy to make clean water that people can, can drink is actually a very interesting challenge. Be at the center of an advancement in transformational technology and innovation to help meet the global need for secure and affordable water. So that's a really good point for our community, right? We drink lots of fresh water that is desalinated with the reverse osmosis system, and it's very energy expensive, right? So how can we use renewable energy to solve that problem? So we had a show and tell day in our garage here with all the four competitors that we were going to deploy their devices. So maybe we could change it up a little bit because we're doing pretty well on time. If, um, if I'm talking about something and you see something that you have a question about, just stop me and... Parker can bring the mic over. Um, this group, this team, uh, <clears throat> I think they're from the Air Force, right? Air Force folks. This fellow is a rock star pilot, and he, he was kind of atypical to me as a pilot. Like he was very soft spoken, really nice guy. This was this was uh, this was their cool device, and they used a commercial off the shelf Zodiac, as you can see, and. They had six electrical generators with six tethers that ran down underwater. And as this thing did this, it was turning those generators. And then they put this big shroud over it to protect all that equipment from the salt water when we deployed it. So when we show you the field pictures of it, you can't see all this stuff. But you can see them working on it. And the idea was they could put this together. Was it? I think they had a 10-hour day, basically, to unpack that crate and put their device together and be done. So that was part of the challenge. It has to be easy. Any questions about that? All right. 
Uh, this was the team that won. This is Oneka. Um, this is a pretty cool device. You'll see it in the water. But we had this great day where we had, these are some of my students from the class that I teach for the semester at the coast. We had public, the public come out, check out everything. This water base, this device pressurizes water and forces it through a semi-permeable membrane. So it's not making electricity, it's just using this giant device as a pump. And when Tripp, my research scientist, got on this to activate it, um, he said it was incredible because as soon as a little wave hit it or something, it was like these big lungs just going <gasps> and just pumping. He was like, holy crap, this thing's alive. It's crazy. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. We had, we had some students from NCA and T come down that have been involved in wave energy too, and they all got a chance to talk to some of the competitors. This is the device on the pier. And so in the background, you can see that uh, this is a spider crane. So you'll see this in some of the pictures. We drove this out on tank tracks and then put it on, on the pier and deployed everything that we needed to over the side of the pier so we wouldn't have to go through the beach. And that has to do with some of the permitting issues that you have going back and forth over the beach. Did I miss anything? Any questions so far? Does that make sense? Good, good, all right. So this is us with Oneka getting it rigged up. Um, this is Trip, who was on the device getting it started. So the way we would do this is we would drop it overboard. You'll see a picture of us doing this with another device. And then we'd pull, uh, this is the water hose to the device, and there's a line right here. And this line was run from that anchor chain pile to the foot of the pier and pulled taut by the divers. And then we would affix the, uh, the, the hose to that line in an ingenious way that, one, that Corey that works here came up with. We have this oceanographer's tape that we learned of from the field research facility and we can't stop using it. It's called Pasco tape. It's PVC tape and it's very selfish so it loves to stick to itself underwater and it's super tough. And so we could wrap this hose around that taut line to keep it from sloshing all over the place and yet the tape didn't chafe the hose over time because it was just the perfect solution. So we did that with all the devices. So we pull this in, into place and the team on the pier would be rolling all the hose out and then we affix it to the anchor and then you start the device. And this is the project 816. I always get the numbers wrong. But you can see this is the one with all the different pulleys. You can kind of see the the lines coming out from the pulleys, but that's about it. All these lines came down to a bridle and then attached to the anchor. <clears throat> and in the background, you can see another device. We'll see it again, but this is MZSP. This device was perpendicular to the wave, and basically it had a hinge on it, and that hinge was the pump, so it would flex like this. <clears throat> This is the Water Bros device. This is the, the device that came out of uh, UNC Charlotte and Wes Williams' team and Landon Mackey. This is Landon. We really like this device. This is also just a pump. It's not a generator. So it's got um, an axle here, and uh, you can see the wheel. The line comes down to the anchor, and as it comes up and down, it's spinning an axle that's running a pump. And we really like this device because you can see how small it is. And we, it's, it's something that we thought was a great device for deploying and recovering, and it's pretty robust. So when I look at a lot of these things, it's funny. Like, if you've worked in the ocean a long time, you look at things one way. And if you've worked in the engineering lab a long time, you look at them another. Like, the engineering lab is like, we want the most efficient, best thing we can get. And then I look at something, I'm like, I can put that in the water and recover it, and it's going to live, right? <laughs> so I like that, that device for that reason. And here's the Water Bros device going overboard. So Water Bros is, what's the B? Verse Osmosis System, but it's some B. I always forget the B, but it's an acronym. It's not just some dudes that like making a WEC, but, <laughs> although it is. But <clears throat> um, So this is the Water Bros device going overboard. And the way we would do this is we would lower a device down, and I would sit in the boat and basically... Um, watch the waves, and we get the device as low as we felt comfortable over a wave crest and time it so a wave crest would come, and then I'd say, pull the release, and there's a release, and it would drop. So you can see that happening right here. 
and it's really only dropping about a foot. And we did that with all the stuff, the jet ski, the Zodiac, and the wave energy converters. This is us hooking up the Water Bros device. You can see the hose coming back. Same thing, there'll be a line on the bottom. And this is the MZSP device that does this. You can kind of see it flexed here. And the water line that's going over, it's a pump device as well. This is us getting it on the mooring and getting it fired up. And this is the GoPro that's somewhere on the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> Didn't even live through the deployment. <clears throat> you can see I'm, I'm thrilled at this very moment. Look at that face. <laughs> All right, so the other thing that happened during Waves to Water and then afterwards is, as Scott said, the NREL team built their own device. So they wanted to go through the motions and see how difficult this was for the teams and learn themselves. So they built this HeroWeck uh, Hydraulic and Electrical Reverse Osmosis. We have to have all these fancy acronyms, right? And we deployed this for a day to practice deploying devices to see what it was like. We did this twice before the competitors came out. And um, this device is cool because here you can see it has a generator. Same concept, it's got a line going to an anchor pile and it comes up and down and it spins an axle and it either turns a generator like the alternator in your car and it makes electricity or we tested this for about five days after the wastewater competition. We put the whole device out for 10, tested it with the generator for five days, then we picked the thing up and swapped out a pump. And so in this case, the device is just pumping pressurized water straight to a reverse osmosis system like most of the devices I showed you. So it can do either or, depending on your needs. You could use the electricity to run a pump, to, but it's less efficient, right, to do that. Any questions about that? All right, I hope I have some discussion afterwards. You guys are quiet. <clears throat> this is us deploying it for Miss Caroline. This is right off of Jeanette's pier. You can see the divers getting ready to move it into place and put the anchor on it, or put it on the anchor. This is Scott. This is his, really, Scott led this whole team that put this thing together, and he was fantastic to work with. So, great listener. He's from Colorado. He knew he didn't know what he didn't know about the ocean, and he was, you know, great to work with. So, I think we're going to put this thing out for a few months at Jeanette's took it back to Colorado to revamp it. It was initially made during COVID, so it was hard to get parts. And we tried to get commercial off-the-shelf parts and not focus on building something that could last for a long, long time, but just do it quickly and inexpensively. Um, now we're going to think more about the materials and things <coughs> so that we can put it out there for a few months, test it again. And this is what it looks like in action. So you can kind of see like when the waves go by, it's kind of pulled down, right? It's really putting some tension on, on the anchor line. So this was the first good swell that we had, and we just couldn't stop going out to the end of the pier to kind of bite our nails and watch this thing and hope that it worked. It's very cool, and it did work. It went really well. All right, so I'm changing gears here to a couple other cool projects that are going on unrelated to waves. These are currents. So um, the two devices that you see here are, are from the teams at NC State University that I work with, so <clears throat> or that we work with. On the left-hand side is a tethered biaxial turbine that is actually yawed. And so this thing would be set up like this where it's on anchor. It kind of is yawed in like this direction. And there's a buoy here. And so as the current passes over it, the reason that it's yawed is that um, you can get fresh flow on both rotors, right? So if you had it aligned with the current, the second rotor would be in the turbulence of the first. So this way it gets clean flow on both of the rotors to some extent. And it is um, counter-rotating. Why would it be counter-rotating? Yeah, keep, and keep the torque, right, from turning the thing. So. That's the idea. Um, so this is a really, this is one of my favorite devices because when you see pictures of this actual thing, you'll say, oh, I could deploy that and recover. That could live out there for months. 
And then the other project we've been working on that is really moving along fast is an ocean kite. And so <clears throat> this works a couple of different ways, but essentially the kite flies in a figure eight um, cross current. So that means if the current's going this way, the kite's flying <coughs> like this. And this is a controls problem for engineers. So essentially they're trying to get this kite to autonomously fly in figure eights such that it flies under very high tension when it's spooling out. So it's on a tether that goes to a winch. And so you're turning the winch as it's flying this figure eight kind of like this. And then it flies under low tension to spool back in. So you use a little bit of that energy to bring the kite back in. And essentially, you're yo-yoing a generator like this. Um, in this picture, you can see that it has turbines on the wings. The reason for that is <clears throat> we've started doing this project as a concept thinking about putting this in the Gulf Stream, either from something that's moored on the bottom or flip it upside down and run it from a barge down. And in Gulf Stream flow, those are relatively fast ocean currents, or the fastest really, so five knot currents. It's more efficient to do the spool in, spool out with the winch. If you're in really slow currents, then it's more efficient to have turbines on the wings. So we're thinking about doing this both ways. And so what we've been doing is taking these devices out to Lake Norman, because Lake Norman has these long fetches of very deep water where we can tow for a long time and simulate the current on them. So this is uh, Kenneth Granlin and Matt Bryant. This is their brainchild. This is the biaxial turbine. And we put this behind the boat on the little orange tether here. And we towed it along and simulated the current. And we're getting ready to do that again but in the backyard here for about a week, in like a week. Yeah. Oh, and the reason that we're doing that is this device had a generator inside of it. The one we're going to tow in the backyard has a pump. So it can just do reverse osmosis by pumping water from the device up the line to a reverse osmosis system. These are some of the NC students working on the device. This is the device in the water. And this is the kite. So at the same time, we took this kite out to the lake and we tow tested the kite. So this is Dylan. He's a master's student at NC State University. And he's getting ready to launch the kite off the boat. The boat, as you'll see in a moment, has a, um, has a boom on it. So at the end of the boom is this arm that rotated back and forth and up and down. And essentially, we could, we could know the direction the tether was going as the kite was flying. And I don't, it's like all these computer screens set up in the wheelhouse. And we're watching all the kite stuff and tweaking all the code with it. It's cool. This is what it looks like when it's all set up. So, that winch that's yo-yoing in and out is right here. The tether runs from the winch through the boom to that arm thingy on the bottom. And then we tow the kite along. And this is what it looks like in action. So this project uh, was funded by the Department of Energy to get to this stage and um, is now funded by the Defense Advanced Projects Agency. So this is like a cloak and dagger thing. Um, <laughs> it's been an interesting project for me because it's controlled information, and some of it's classified. And no one's going to give me class classified clearance, right? Nobody. But <laughs> even, the, even the controlled information piece is important, right? So um, that's why there's this website at the bottom. I'm not going to tell you much about this, aside from the fact that our kite's going on it in a grander scale. And you can read on the website what you're allowed to read about it, and I won't get myself in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's that? <laughs> oh God, I, that's why I'm way down here on the chain, right? Um, but this is a cool project because the kite is going to be huge, like the size of this table, and it's going to be in the ocean doing this in about two years, like action. So we're going from an idea that was on paper five or six years ago to something like this, which is really exciting. Hey, what's, that, what's that piece that's tethered to the body of that manna that's above it? That's the kite. So the manna isn't the kite. The manna is whatever they do with that. And this thing provides <laughs> energy to the, the big thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Do we really have to stay on this slide? Of all the slides, you guys want to this slide. Is the manta is that attached or tethered to the bottom also of the ocean? Could be. <laughs> you can go read about it right here. You'll be able to see this talk online and get this link. And then I can get my classified clearance. Uh, I don't want my classified. There's a lot of F-bombs that come with classified. <laughs> I don't want to have anything to do with that. All right. So uh, this is us working in the Gulf Stream. And that's all I had to share with you all tonight. So I'm happy to continue to answer some questions and, and talk about the stuff that we're doing. And thanks for coming. Thank you. On those uh, fresh drinking water um, items, like how much volume would would they do in I don't know half hour's time? Like what what's what's the volume that they um, capable of? It depends on the wave field and the, the device, of course. But we have things this size, and I imagine you would fill how many liters of those? You know those big plastic things? Does anyone remember? Hundred probably. 100 liters, and if you had a good swell on like the Oneka device, you'd probably fill that with fresh water in a day, maybe half a day. With the big surprises that you, you found out. Oh, you got to take. Oh. The big surprises. Oh, the big surprises? Uh, lots. Like, it's crazy. I was just looking, I was having a sandwich, and I was looking at the board, the whiteboard, where we were preparing for this stuff, and when you really get into thinking about how you're going to do it, there's a zillion little details down to like, oh, I need zip ties for this, or I need, you know, and it just goes on and on. So you kind of have to bring the kitchen sink on the boat and, and do a lot. Of, um, one of the biggest, I'll be honest with you, the biggest challenge with the Waves to Water project was that uh, the, the competitors, we didn't get the devices until right before we were going to deploy them. And then it was like, oh, that mooring line's not going to work. It won't live like that. And we're trying to quickly in 24 hours figure out a solution that we think will work. And that was a big challenge because a lot, a lot of the mooring lines broke on those devices and we ended up recovering them that way. I think recall you had a big storm that came through. We did. Yeah. You know, for us, it wasn't a big storm, but it was a big blow overnight and like a meter and a half waves kind of thing. Yeah. How durable are those devices? Which one? They're all different. Yeah, well, I mean, in, in, in general, like like the wing-looking thing, you know, I mean, is it as durable as the one that was like in a little raft deal? Yeah, some are much more so than others, and some are learning the answer to that question now when we're putting them in, right? Then we'll change out materials because we broke something. and I mean, the, the solution is really put it in the ocean and break it and take it out and figure out what happened, and that's just the way it is. But... Um, I think the biaxial turbine like, could be really durable for months, given some little bit more thought. Some of the other ones are a lot more fragile. The kite's a tricky one, right, because it has a lot of moving parts. It's very complicated. Right. Well, the turbine's just... <clears throat> spinning, too spinning. I have two questions. Uh, when at the uh, pre-prepared questions, well, I actually been taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the uh, that the uh, is there extra energy at the Hatter's front? So in other words, could you capture more energy from ocean currents there because you're having a confluence? No, it actually that's not. A, there, there is a current that's kind of driven by that, but it's not energetic relative to like the Gulf Stream. Okay. But what, what is cool from a science perspective is there aren't that many places where all this water comes together and goes what we say cross isobath, which means water, because of the physics, likes to flow along the same depth contour. And for the most part, it tends to do that. And so Cape Hatteras is where all this water comes together it can't do that because it can't go on land, so it goes offshore, it goes cross ice path. And what's important about that is it's a place where there's an opportunity for exchange between the deep ocean and the shelf. 
So all the stuff we put in the water, this is how it gets into the deep ocean. And we're trying to understand whether that's a carbon source or sink there. Water's upwelled from the Gulf Stream. Water's downwelled there along the Hatteras Front underneath the Gulf Stream. Sorry, it's a long-winded answer, but it's the stuff I really like. And um, so many questions. But that, the, the tethered, um, there's tethered coaxial. Um, have you been able to really establish how much energy you can capture using those? Um, that's a good question. I don't think the, that's been answered yet, but it's a scale thing too, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. I think what we'd like to be able to do with that is demonstrate for a long time that we can put that thing in the ocean for months and light an LED and say, hey, look, it works, right? We're doing something. And then the next step is, okay, what do we really want to do? And the ultimate vision at Jeanette's, and it's George's vision, we have a microgrid that we built to put at Jeanette's to hook up various devices that can handle all kinds of different inputs, DC, AC, lots of different um, amperages and fluctuations. And ultimately what we'd like to do is to take the energy that we're getting from some of these devices and put them at charging stations for cars in the parking lot. And that's what George is hell-bent to do, and we're all with him. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mike, you called uh, the Gulf Stream, didn't you call it a western boundary current? Where'd the west come from? Um, the physics have it, has it such that in, oops, in, the, in the northern hemisphere, whenever you have an ocean basin, because of the rotation of the earth and lots of other things, you have an intensified current on the western side of the basin. And so Japan has the same thing. They have the Kuroshio current. It's not quite as much volume, but about the same current velocity. And um, there's lots more. Um, that it's kind of a misnomer. It's more of like the northern hemisphere, but there's the, the Brazil current, the East Australia current, the Angulus. Those are all those intensified currents. And it's crazy to think about because the ocean's in like two layers. So the surface layer, the currents are driven by the wind. Down below, like I mentioned, the deep western boundary current, the currents are driven by density changes. So um, in the surface layer, you can get in your boat, drive across the Gulf Stream, and come home in a day, right, roughly. That's all the water in the Atlantic Ocean that's flowing north in the surface layer drive the rest of the way across the Atlantic Ocean and the water's coming back south. So that's how much water. You're moving about 30 times the flow of all the rivers on Earth off of Cape Hatteras and the Gulf Stream. So an immense amount of energy and volume of water. George. So Mike, uh, what are some opportunities that offshore wind presents? For ah, that's a great question. So for whatever reason, um, and I don't, I don't know the answer to this. The Department of Energy has different branches. And the offshore wind or the wind branch is separate from the ocean energy branch, which has kind of made this artificial separation between the two, which is unfortunate. And we're trying to bring that back together. So you all heard that offshore wind is really happening, right? There's an offshore wind lease off Kitty Hawk. And so we'd like to partner with those folks because of the permitting that goes on, the biological evaluations, all that stuff that they do is the same thing we'd have to do to put a wave energy converter in. So it's like, why don't we do it all at once together, right? And the power companies really want to see a diversified resource. So when the wind's not blowing, you could have waves, right? So you have all this infrastructure out there. You have the grid running out there. Let's attach these things. So we've been advocating strongly for that. We have some folks in the governor's office there helping us along. but. It's a great opportunity to do it all, hybrid stuff, and we're going in that direction. Europe is really going in that direction, as we saw when we were in Spain at this International Co Conference on Ocean Energy. They are just taking off. <clears throat> Sean. It's just me, barely. But uh, has anyone tried to include also floating solar along with that? Yes. That's a big thing. Yeah. Good question. And you could even have... There's some really neat stuff, some, some research that we're funding in um, the Renewable Ocean Energy Program where you have these like gels and when they're stretched, they make electricity. They basically drive an electric current. So you could imagine doing something like that with solar that also the wave energy was giving you power too. 
There's some really neat stuff going on. Okay, look, the mic is so, so that uh, the folks online can hear too. So. <laughs> Um, well, I've had a question before, but now I have another one that just popped up. So the first one is back to the competition, the Waves to Water competition. Were all of the devices deployed at the same time, or how were, how were they judged? How could you compare with the outside variables? That is a terrific question, because we spent months trying to figure this out. <laughs> um, so in terms of the deployment, that's something that our team is extremely proud of because we deployed them all in one day. And we're like, that's, that's it, they're all out, which was a big undertaking and took a lot of planning. Um, in terms of the success or failure of devices in the competition, there were different categories and there had to be some flexibility. So the teams were really good at understanding that and not being super angry about that, but it was necessary. So you had, for example, who can make the most fresh water, right? Who can be deployed and recovered the easiest, right? Um, what were some of the other ones? There was... Lightest weight. Was yeah, lightest weight. Oh, um, who can set up their device out of the box the fastest, right? How long does that take? Because the idea was like, if you had a Puerto Rico, and you needed fresh water, could you drop a box in and have that thing offshore pumping water in 24 hours? But, you know, temperature, waves, and all that changes can change within hours. So how did that affect the first device deployed compared to the last one? Did oh, that, that's a good question. Yeah, so we, uh, that's why they were all deployed at once, because we, we would rather just focus on one device, but the idea is we want to have them all in the same environment. Um, but there was some consideration less in terms of the environment for the deployment day than, um, than for you know, other devices that were more complicated holding up the ones that were simple. So we tried to get the simple ones in first then get the complicated ones in. And no one started the competition until they were all in on their moorings. And uh, it's like, okay, let's start making water and see what happens. <clears throat> and then my next question just came up when you were talking about um, the wind and then the biology and all of that. We, it's kind of obvious the impact on biology with windmills and things in the air, but what kind of impact on ocean animals with these kind of under the water devices? That's a good question. So I think the, the simple answer is we don't know yet, but essentially if you imagine the kite, like the kite that we're working on now could have a tether that's hundreds of meters long swinging through the water. Mm -hmm. And can a whale see that or not? Or can right. a turtle see that? Or okay. there's an example. Or there's always a concern in the beginning of just, we talk, like a lot of work's been done to put turbines out. What will a school of fish do around a turbine? Like the first thing folks say, well, they're all just going to get chopped up. <laughs> so then there was like videos of these turbines underwater with fish. And the fish were like, yeah, you're not going in. <laughs> <laughs> so we've had no big setbacks in terms of that yet. But there are a lot of questions still. This isn't a question, it's a comment on your first question. And your first question was, you know, did they all go in the water at the same time? Well, they also, the beginning photographs there, they had an open house and a show and tell. Mm -hmm. It was absolutely fascinating listening to each group tell how they were going to do things. <coughs> and the best part was there was one group that there was a kid, maybe seventh or eighth grade, was asking questions. And all of us graybeards were standing around, and they said, does anybody else have a question? We all, no, no, he's doing it. <laughs> but it was fascinating, that open house. I just wish that there'd been a videotaping of the different people asking questions to them, and that really would have been sharp. There is. John there did is. that. All yeah, right. did, John has some of that footage. Yeah, so we'll try to get that out there for you. Right here. So what's your thinking on how far out it might be before we would see production out of some of these for in a commercial manner? Uh, if that kite isn't producing energy in two years, I'm going to be in trouble. 
<laughs> yeah, so that's soon, like to do the deployment and do that. Um, I think in the next couple of years, we'll have some longer term deployments at Jeanette's that go months and do that, either water or energy, depending. Uh, there's, there's a lot of investment in that, and so it's exciting. A long term, I think it's a political question, right? Because this is the fact, it's, and you know, people say, that's why we have this like powering the blue economy initiative, which is like, how can you take ocean energy devices and provide power or water in some niche area? Because they're not cost competitive right now with solar and wind for green energy. And the reason for that is that solar and wind have been around for 50, 100 years, and the technology's gotten to the point where it's cheap, right? We're not there yet, so it's expensive. So starting on something like this, how can we just make fresh water or um, I'm on a couple of projects to use a wave energy converter part for that Pioneer Ray that's coming down here to power ocean instruments offshore. There's no energy offshore. Can you use wave energy to do it? You can use solar and wind, but let's try to incorporate wave. Jacqueline. Hi, Mike. Hi. Um, you talked a bit about including social science and stakeholder engagement in these uh, wave energy turbines and in your research. Or do you have any plans in your lab moving forward to include social science and stakeholder engagement? That is a great question. Well, you know that I do because it's part <laughs> of your PhD dissertation. So as soon as I get that dissertation proposal, it's, uh, um, <laughs> so it's funny you should ask. So there, that project I was just talking about the Pioneer Array and, um, and the Wave Energy Converter, which is a microcosm of that for the Pioneer Array, um, we're going to be on that project in phase one. And one thing that the Coastal Studies Institute is going to provide is social science and stakeholder engagement. And I'm trying to figure out if I have enough money in phase one to include some of my colleagues funded to do social science. So yes. <laughs> How do you include what you're doing with uh, the local students, like maybe the College of Albemarle um, local high schools, That's to cool. generate more interest like Jacqueline had um, to take her down that road to, to pursue what she's doing right now with her PhD? Um, I can answer that question from my lab's perspective, which is about that much, not enough as I'd like to. And Parker can answer that question from her crew's perspective because they do a hell of a lot. So from our lab, what we do is um, well, we have an eighth grade student, the first eighth grade intern that's ever been here at CSI because she wouldn't take no for an answer. And I was like, wow. we got to get that kid involved here because she wants to be here. And she's been working with us for three years. But that's just one kid. So Parker, tell them about some of the things that you all do. We have a variety of um, different outreach programs, whether that's for students that are visiting from local schools. We also have summer camps um, and different uh, events like this that we're having tonight. And so they involve different levels um, of, I guess, activities, depending on who we're interacting with. But one of my favorite things that we do um, I guess starting about a year ago, we started developing an activity where um, the students who are visiting take um, a handful of tinker toys and they get a coil of copper wire and a magnet and they have to make their own um, wave energy converter and we test it in a little 10 foot, 8 inch tub uh, back and forth and they get to see what kind of minuscule but still effective energy that they uh, generate. And we also have things like the Blue Heron Bowl here, the Offshore Wind Challenge for Kids, where it's a competition for all these different teams to come from all around North Carolina and build devices to see who can build the best device. And Mike, I'll just add one more thing. Can you guys yeah. hear me OK? Yeah. So um, we talked about offshore wind, and that's going to create a lot of job opportunities for Virginia and the Mid-Atlantic, Northeast North Carolina. And those are all kinds of trades, everything from engineering to welders to uh, electricians. And so I think that as that workforce gets developed to support the offshore wind industry, that's going to benefit the marine energy um, as well. So, you know, 
that same workforce can support uh, marine energy deployment as well as the supply chains down the future. And you know, one thing that we've done locally here at CSI that reminded me is we, we took all of our welding equipment and gave it to COA, formalized the relationship between CSI and COA so that we needed some welding work done. They could do it in the welding class. We could work with our students to do things like that. Because of our geographic location, it sounds like our area is one of the ones most conducive to generating energy by putting a turbine in a western boundary current. What is the status of that? That's is, a good is question. Is that anybody getting that to work worldwide anywhere? That's a good question. So um, the Southeastern Marine Renewable Energy Center was founded several years ago in Florida at FAU. And the reason for that is that their proximity to the Gulf Stream there is, you know, it's like a couple miles offshore. And the other big reason for why that's a good spot is because the Gulf Stream is constrained between Florida and, and the Bahama Bank. So it can't wiggle around too much. That's the biggest challenge is that you want to go out there and you want to get energy somewhere and the Gulf Stream moves over here. The other place that the Gulf Stream wiggles around least is off Cape Hatteras. So that's why it's a focus of ours to, to work there, to try to do that there. Now, in terms of timelines, um, the folks down in Florida have a permitted site where they can put turbines in the Gulf Stream and test them for a limited amount of time. We don't have that yet. There just was a call that came out from the Department of Energy for us to do like a background study on how you would get there from here, and we're going after that. So we hope to get funding to say, you know, what are the practicalities? What are the economics? What's the stakeholder engagement? What's the resource? We have a really good idea what the resource is because we have several years of observations that we made here. But there are other questions. And how does all that tie in with these wind leases? A, the, a big question is like, how do you get that energy back? What would you do? How much does that cost? So we're actively trying to address those questions. One more. Oh, one more question. Or no more questions. Oh, there we go. Oh, I noticed you had that young fellow from Iraq. Um, are some countries over in the Middle East where they're pretty dry? Are they interested in reverse reverse uh, osmosis and things like that? I mean, I know they have some of the countries have plenty of oil to burn, but um, any interest over in that part of the world, North Africa? I don't really know the answer to that. Um, you would think that they would be, of course. Political stability is an issue for doing some of that, I guess. I mean, I'm not, I don't know. I haven't heard a lot about that at the international conference. Maybe George has. Um, Zaid, who is from Iraq, and he's got really interesting stuff to tell you about his life growing up there during everything. But uh, Zaid is actually on our team um, because he's an oceanographer like me, and he's doing oceanographic research, not so much renewable energy research. I don't really know the answer, I guess. All right. Well, <laughs> just wrap it up. All right. Thanks, y'all, for coming out. I appreciate you making the trip. Thanks, everybody online. And what a good time. I appreciate it.